the kelp world. Um, I come to the kelp world uh, from the art world, and I got my MFA from San Francisco State um, in the early 90s. Um, and so I was trained as a photographer um, and then started making books and realized that the writing, the combination of word and image is really where a lot of the power lies in kind of telling these stories. Um, and then have become more and more involved in um, the kelp world, the bull kelp world in particular. So what I thought I'd do is share my screen and take you through my journey as an artist into the science of seaweed. Um, so I'll take, we'll just get rolling here. Um, so again, um, thanks. We had a wonderful session last week at the California Seaweed Festival up here in Tiburon. I don't know if any of you guys missed it. This is a little bit of a recap um, of that presentation, um, but it was absolutely one. There were tons of grad students, especially highlighting the students in the CSU system. Um, there were local pe people involved with seaweed and food. And this idea of bringing art and science together uh, really plays across all these different constituencies and is really a powerful vehicle for um, telling uh, these seaweed stories. Um, and this is what I've been doing for many years now. Um, so I have been making images of uh, the marine algae using my flatbed scanner, and I'm able to translate these images into all sorts of different formats. Uh, so I have gallery shows with fine artwork on museum walls and in galleries. Uh, but what I've come to really appreciate is printing um, these uh, these scans of the seaweeds onto this fabric that allows me to translate um, the seaweeds onto so many different into so many different forums and 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 spaces. Um, so usually, I actually am pretty assiduous about actually naming the seaweeds as I go through these talks. We have erythrophyllum and agresia and palmaria and. Uh, giant kelp or macrocystis. Um, and often I'm really talking to a, a much more public audience. You guys are probably all um, pretty well versed in the seaweeds, I would guess. So um, I might skip over that side, but it is important to me um, to have the names there. Um, this was an installation um, in a really underused um, shopping center in Alameda here in the Bay Area, and the Alameda Arts Commission invited a bunch of artists to try to enliven this space. And this was an old video store, which needless to say had been empty for many, many years. It probably still is empty, but um, this was the storefront that I was given. And then there was a whole festival, there was uh, food trucks and dance performances and children's performances and um, uh, and other artists work in this space. And so the great macrocyst has got to be a backdrop for that. Um, and this is uh, from this very recent exhibit that I hope if any of you are in the Bay Area, you're able to get up here uh, to downtown San Francisco uh, at 836M Gallery. And um, afterwards, as we get into some questions, I can drop that in the chat. Um, you can make a reservation to have a visit. It's been a wonderful bringing together um, of a number of us artists who really forefront bull kelp as a, a central organizing theme to an art exhibit. Um, so it's uh, five women artists from the Bay Area. And um, uh, this is one of the, the chief pieces that holds down the exhibit. Um, that is again these fabric banners uh, that allow light to come through and show kind of the glory of these organisms that we're all really pretty um, fascinated by and intent on kind of trying to bring to to this broader audience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that exhibit um, later on. So how did it begin? Um, well, it began for me quite a while ago in about 2009, I was working on a book called Beach, a Book of Treasure. Uh, and I'd, I'd done a number of books already, one on beach stones, one on seashells. And I really wanted to focus on the beach as this, this portal into the ocean world, this space where beachcombers, people who are not divers, who might not have the chance to go snorkeling, get to encounter the ocean world. And it's really through what we find at the beach. Um, and I was uh, training to be a docent uh, up here on the Duxbury Reef, which is our really fabulous tide pooling up here. Um, and went out with a group from the California Academy to learn about the, the Rocky Reef uh, ecology. And what I found is that everyone was talking about um, 
not what I was seeing the most of. There was a lot of talk about the nudibranchs and the starfish and the sculpin fish and the crabs and the limpets and all that. And yet here I looked down and all I saw was algae and no one was really talking about it. And I held a scrap up to the sky and I was like, oh boy, <laughs> I have to get this back to my scanner into the studio. Um, there's been a lot of energy since then on on um, the marine algae, and that's been a great, you know, a really a great delight for me to see evolve. These kind of underrepresented organisms begin to to get the spotlight that they deserve. So this is the scanner in my studio. Um, it's right here next to me where I'm sitting. Um, I've had the same scanner for many years. I've actually got a slightly updated um, model, but it's no better than this one. Um, so to capture um, um, to capture this um, the, the seaweed and get the transparency, I actually use this upper section of the scanner that has that white cover on it. And I take the white cover off and there's a second light element up there that when I lower it down, I might use some of those stone helpers so it doesn't smush my uh, specimen. Um, that's that light element in the in the top part, the transparency adapter actually pushes light through my specimen as the scan is being captured. And then the scan goes right up, comes right up into Photoshop and I work with it either there or in Lightroom. And then if I'm building a book, I'll be working over in InDesign. Um, so it's this very kind of smooth uh, workflow that I have between the organism itself, the scanner, and then um, my digital uh, design, imaging and design world. Um, so here you have some beautiful erythrophyllum. Um, and uh, I, you can see that I scan it either wet or dry, um, that there's uh, some of these um, nice little wet puddles that are from the water. Um, and then I also have really worked on these more um, uh, abstracted collages using the specimens themselves. So you can really always see what organism I'm actually using. Uh, here is some Maziella and Erythrophila mixed together with, I think, a little Prionetus in there to give this incredible, lovely um, uh, variations of purple and brown. Um, so here's the great Halosachion or CSAX. Um, if I'm giving a talk to a classroom of students, uh, or, or others who are really interested in uh, the nearshore ecology. I will talk about strategies for surviving um, this funny world that is uh, the intertidal zone where um, the, the, these organisms atmosphere, if you will, the ocean gets kind of sucked away and comes back twice every six hours. Uh, and that we have a hard time envisioning that. We can't really imagine our atmosphere getting sucked out and coming back. Uh, twice a day. Um, and that these uh, sea sacs actually hydrate from within, which is a very different strategy for success than um, the more folio seaweeds that dry out. Um, and here, I'm really reveling in the uh, forms and colors that these seaweeds are presenting to me as a designer. Um, the incredible Maziella volans really are these funny spoon-shaped um, uh, species in the in the Maziella genus. Um, they're that crazy color purple. And to pair them with the whimsical egregia blades, I mean egregia pods uh, from the Duxbury Reef. Um, and you could see this was made way back in 2013. And when I was doing talks in that year, I was like, you know, the, the seaweeds really need to be more popularly out there. They're so beautiful and they're so um they're, they're revealing a world so unlike ours, they should be on cards and posters and tea towels. You know, you, you get ferns and you get mushrooms and um, heirloom peaches on tea towels. Why not seaweeds? And by golly, at the seaweed festival, there was a woman selling seaweed tea towels. So we've really come a long way in 10 years, um, which is great. Um, and my artist's eye and my artist's kind of sense of play gets to work with this incredible diversity of forms and shapes and colors. Uh, these are two historical scans of Gloeo siphonia um, that I kind of put together. Uh, these were pressed in the 1880s. So I had access to um, the UC, Herbar UC Berkeley's herbarium where these historical pressings are. Um, and then I overlaid some other seaweed color on them. Uh, and this is a print that is up. Um, it's, I think, printed on metal in a couple of different uh, hospital um, installations. 
and the great agregia or feather boa kelp, agregia menziesii has really been a favorite. Um, I walk, my beach that I walk here in San Francisco is Fort Funston. Um, it's uh, where I really go to connect to the ocean on a very regular basis. So a lot of my specimens are just picked up having washed up at Fort Funston as was this one. And it's just such a jazzy, um, it was such a fabulous specimen. I, Agresia is one of those organisms I know that I have to get onto my scanner pretty quickly because it goes kind of dark and it loses its fabulousness um, once it's dried. And I also tasked myself uh, with Agresia was the, the kind of story that I chose when I was developing the proposal for the Curious World of Seaweed book to see if I could write an essay about the natural history of the feather boa kelp and the history of the science that was really entitled Empathy for a Kelp. This organism that's so unlike anything that we recognize from our backyards, from our terrestrial world, could we go into its world and, and where there, you know, the power of gravity isn't so important, something that we've internalized so profoundly, um, where again, it lives in this intertidal zone that's so, um, so that was in, in any case, that was the, the first essay of my book, um, The Curious World of Seaweed. Um, and I also, Agresia really gave me kind of a new way of, um, of thinking about making some artwork, um, I really wanted to play with this idea of abstraction. And so I actually was gaining inspiration, not only from the Agresia, but also from an, a local artist, Rex Ray, here in San Francisco, who very much walked the line between um, graphic design and fine art. Uh, and he would make these wonderful, col exuberant collages using um, these organic shapes that he would cut out of this pattern paper that he would make. And I thought, well, I could use the egregia blades in the same way uh, that Rex Ray was using his pieces of paper. So that kind of inspiration comes uh, from, from all over. And then um, I made another, uh, an ongoing series of these abstractions, uh, really trying to play off these amazing color combinations that the seaweeds, that the seaweeds offer us. Um, and again, another example of how I can scan. So this is Nori, um, and um, I really, uh, you know, Nori is the one seaweed that people kind of, in a really popular way, people understand that we eat it, that it's um, part of this kind of broader culture, um, uh, not only the Japanese culture, but the native Californian culture, which is really, this is the kind of most common edible seaweed that is recognized kind of across the board. Um, it has this really broad array of color. I was able to scan it um, both wet, as you can see in these lefty, these dusky green uh, leftmost scans where you can see the reproductive elements are all around the edges. And then these um, dried deep purple uh, nori dancers, as I call them. So as I was um, developing, really working on scanning these seaweeds and researching uh, the science behind them, I started doing a lot of workshops with Kathy Ann Miller, uh, who, as you all know, I hope you know, is the curator of algae here at UC Berkeley. And UC Berkeley's University Herbarium it really has the repository uh, of um, algal, it's the algal herbarium that really has collected um, the um, holdings of all the marine labs throughout the West Coast. Um, and, and I also um, was running into doing research into Anna Atkins, because Anna Atkins was really one of the foremost, um, or one of the earliest advocates for the seaweeds besides outside of uh, the William Henry Harveys that were actually describing them. And she, Anna Atkins, um, was, a, uh, was a Victorian polymath, uh, a woman with many, many talents, uh, who made the first photographically reproduced book. And that book was of her collection of marine algae. And it was made out, up of these cyanotype impressions. So the cyanotype technique is a very, is a um, kind of nascent photographic technique whereby uh, paper is coated with a light sensitive emulsion. And it's a combination of ferric uh, compounds that produce uh, a UV sensitive emulsion on paper. And when you expose it to sunlight, um, the part that is that is getting hit by the UV uh, goes to blue and the part that is shadowed by your specimen 
um, gets washed out in the water wash um, that that you wash it with after you've exposed it. So I thought, oh, I could make in, in Anna Atkins's honor, I could make some cyanotypes myself out in my backyard. You can see the um, cytosiphon here on the right and a combo that I've made in my computer over on the left with some of the halosachions there in the shadow. Um, and as I've been, as I was making these cyanotypes in my yard, there's, it's a very slow and contemplative process. I realized that my, um, my own scans are actually operating in this same historical lineage as the cyanotype printing, which is this lineage of, of nature printing, whereby um, the, the print is made from the specimen itself directly. It's not mediated by a botanical illustrator's hand or the lens of a camera. Um, and there is this whole history of nature printing where actual specimens were like put through the press. Um, so I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool to digitize my cyanotypes and then have the scan of the same specimen? It's all one to one in terms of scale, um, play with its shadow. Uh, so I did a whole series of these um, cyanot my own kind of cyanotype impressions um, where my own contemporary scans are in dialogue with this historical process. Um, and there's this kind of connection between uh, past and present. Um, so this is a Puntiella Californica, and it's this brilliant red. It has these kind of mouse ears. Um, again, this was just found in the rack, uh, but in a whole slew of red seaweeds, the Puntiella kind of stands out because its color is just that much different. Um, this is quite a mature piece. Um, and this is one of the more recent interplays of the cyanotype uh, with my scans. And this is called Chasing Kelp, where I've really interlaid a whole series of bull kelp uh, blades and, and um, either pressed um, or whole um, um, bladders uh, with a cyanotype from uh, the, a bull kelp, um, a bull kelp specimen. Um, and bull kelp is really, uh, where my work is going now. Uh, but I thought I'd just take you a little bit into the story of getting to the curious world of seaweed. Um, these are four of the incredible lithographs that are from um, Ruprecht's uh, folio from 1853, where he was describing the five um, or four uh, iconic kelps, no, five iconic kelps, because postelsia isn't in here. Uh, you have on the left, you have the Stephanocystis, which used to be Cystocyra. You have Dictyonurum, Pterogophora, and then on the right is the Egregia. And these are these long unfolding um, panels in the back of his, uh, his um, uh, little pamphlet of, from 1853. And for me, the fact that this, the taxonomic record has this incredibly robust visual component was really fun and, and makes the history of the science not only part of my essay writing, which it very much is in The Curious World, but also part of the image making and part of the research. It's kind of where it all begins. Um, this is me overlaying um, a, a scan of a Costaria costata on its cousin, the Dictyonurum. And then um, you have um, uh, a, a, a scan of of Pyropia or Nori onto the great, uh, one of these great lithographs by Alexander Postels uh, from his folio, Illustrationis Algarum. And you guys are in Southern California and, or many of you, I think, and the Illustrationis Algarum folio, the actual elephant folio by Postels and Ruprecht is in the special collections library at USC. Um, and so um, it's really worth going over there and, and arranging to, to view it um, in, in real life because it's just extraordinary. Um, so it took them about three years to actually digitize it on my request. Uh, and then I got to work with uh, those images. So this is that um, Stephanocystis with its uh, lithograph that I kind of switched to the blue. Um, and then this became the cover of the book. I got I, I build the books as I go along. Um, I'm kind of mapping um, text and image into into a layout um, that becomes bigger than the sum of the parts. I hope. And then I got get to work with the art director and and designer at the in this case it's Heyday Books here in Berkeley. They're a wonderful nonprofit 
um, publisher. So there are 16 chapters in The Curious World of Seaweed, each one hitting a kind of iconic California or West Coast um, kelp or seaweed and uh, touching on different topics. But, but I like to say that these 16 chapters is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the incredible richness in the algal um, flora of our West Coast. And, and, and I'm up in Northern California. And so I, I kind of like to explain why is California so rich? Um, we know that there are plenty of whales and sharks and plankton and fish and such, but the, the flora is also so rich and diverse because of this amazing upwelling and the upwelling um, happens uh, because we often in the spring get these enormous winds. And this is me taking this picture at McCarricker State Park up in Mendocino. Um, and if you were up there this spring, you knew that the winds did not stop. It was very, very windy. Um, so these um, spring winds are pushing the surface waters away and allowing the upwelling, the deeper, richer, nutrient dense waters uh, to come up to the surface. And so those nutrients are, and, and cold waters are as important for the algae uh, in, the, in the near shore as they are for all the marine life uh, that is offshore. Um, and if you're on the, on the shore, um, like I am and many of the people that I know that really are, are kind of beach watchers, um, you might encounter this kind of richness in the algal detritus that gets pushed up on shore. And there's just this richness of pattern and color and shape um, and smell, if you actually get close enough to it, you'll see all the kelp flies and this richness then uh, will translate and carbon will translate up into the nearshore ecologies. But it also gives you a sense of the diversity of the seaweeds. Um, and so this is a chance to kind of explain the three evolutionary lineages that are the taxonomic groups that we use today, which is the greens, the reds, and the brown. Um, and you all really probably know and are going kind of deep into the science of the pigmentation of the seaweeds, but I like to highlight how, um, how resourceful they are, you know, that, that we as humans are so used to red daylight uh, in terms of it be being the norm. We don't realize that it's actually a very specific wavelength of light that doesn't necessarily penetrate the ocean waters, um, and that um, the reds and browns that the greens um, gave rise to our, our terrestrial plants and that the reds and the browns have these accessory pigments uh, that allows them to collect different wavelengths of light. Um, and that's these, these really remarkable kind of um, resilience and strategy uh, uh, and resourcefulness that the seaweeds are, are showing us. So there's a whole chapter on color uh, in the book and I use uh, Maziella here as my um, kind of signature for that chapter. Um, when it dries, it dries to this perfect purple that is this real combination of the red and blue accessory pigments um, that, um, uh, that are uh, what make the red seaweeds that incredible array of magentas and purples and deep reds. Um, I have a chapter on the coralline algae, of course, because they are so important. And what I find is that once you kind of show people what the coralline algae is, they'll, they'll notice it. It's very small and fragile uh, in the rack line, uh, but it's usually always there. Um, so you have the encrusting coralline on this incredible bottle that um, Kathy Ann Miller, this is from Kathy Ann Miller's collection and she has allowed me to scan and show and exhibit um, and then the um, and then the articulated coralline. And this whole strategy towards, um, towards um, avoiding herbivory, by calcifying in your cell walls is just something that you know is is a wonderful way to talk about the seaweeds and and their variety of um, of how to how to survive in the intertidal zone. Um, and there's a chapter on the seagrasses. Uh, these are some of the uh, zostera um, specimens that Kathy Ann Boyer um, allowed me to take from her tanks at her lab here at San Francisco State's labs at the EOS Center. Um, and I talk about phyllospadix too, of course, uh, the seagrasses. But I wanna get on to the bull kelp because this is really where I'm putting my energies now. The bull kelp is the second chapter of the book. And as soon as that book came out, COVID came down and we all kind of um, got stuck in our studios. But I realized that this bull kelp, so much was happening as regards the bull kelp 
on our Northern California coast where the kelp was declining rapidly and that story was just coming about uh, to a broader audience. And yet if you went up to, um, to British Columbia or even to um, Oregon, um, uh, Puget Sound, Southeast Alaska and Alaska, very different stories were playing out as around the bull kelp, um, but with the same cast of characters. Um, so I use bull kelp as a really nice way to go through a life cycle uh, of one of these, you know, iconic organisms of our of our coast. Um, these are two wonderful, wonderful historical um, specimens of these babies, and how I can emphasize that the bull kelp does all of this growing from those tiny. Um, little organisms where the bladder is as big as your thumbnail to this majestic uh, majestic organism in just a few months to really emphasize that it's an annual uh, species and that, it, that, that the power of sunlight and these nutrient dense waters gives rise to this enormous amount of biomass in just a few months. Um, so Marco Maza has these beautiful photographs of uh, the bull kelp forest in uh, the springtime as these bladders are trying to get those blades up to the surface uh, to be as efficient as possible in uh, photosynthesizing. And then as an annual, of course, it has to reproduce uh, before it gets torn up by the winter storms. Um, so these are some of the sori patches, uh, these patches that evolve on the blades of the bull kelp uh, during the course of the summer. So that by late summer, um, each of these patches might have millions and millions of spores uh, and they drop away to the ocean bottom uh, so that they can then reproduce in about the same environment as, um, as the plant uh, that it came from. You can see where the sori have started to pull away. And I just, as an artist, I just love the abstractive like possibility of these sori and this incredible halo that uh, the cells at the edge of it create as they're about to give way. Um, so these are prints that are part of a larger exhibit called The Curious World of Seaweed um, and give you a sense of kind of my sense of wonder, even in the deepest nooks and crannies of the kelp uh, life cycle. Um, so what is up with our kelp on the North Coast? And I like to show these three images to kind of tell in a very visceral way uh, that um, kelp uh, has been incredibly abundant on the North Coast. And this is Van Damme State Park in 2008. Uh, 2008 is often used as this kind of baseline year in these graphics that, um, that are used to talk about kelp decline. But I like to point out that 2008 was this apex of an apex year of kelp abundance. So bull kelp is naturally incredibly cyclic in its abundance. It goes in, in kind of three year cycles typically. Um, uh, of abundance and, and then decline. Uh, and this uh, in 2008 was um, really a, a, a biggest of the big years. And this is my friend, Larry Knowles, who's a kelp harvester up there uh, in that year. Um, and the, the photographer, Ron LaValle, who took this picture has since died, uh, passed away, which um, is very sad. He was really, he lived right there near Van Damme State Park, which is right on the way to Mendocino. And I was up there in 2017 also with Larry. We were going um, kayaking and then snorkeling. Uh, and this is in that same kelp bed, um, of course, a little more spread out. Um, and then in 2019 and 2020 and 21 and 22, I go up very regularly to Fort Bragg uh, to um, snorkel up there. I did talks at the Noyo Center for Marine Science. Um, I was shooting um, the kelp story up at uh, Mendocino for the Earthshot Prize in 2021, or was it, yeah, in 20, or maybe it was 2020, no, it was 2021, um, and, um, uh, and I would stop at Van Damme each time at this same pullout and take this picture, and this is what you see, you see no kelp at all. And what struck me, especially that first time in 2019 was it was just, it was this, it was so beautiful. And every time I've stopped, it's so beautiful. The water is very clear. The, the coast is just stunning. Uh, the sand is white. There's usually kayakers going out. So there's nothing to tell us that anything is wrong with this image, unless we know uh, that these kelp are missing. So remembering what we're forgetting is really part of my work now in terms of not only telling the bull kelp story of why uh, it's missing, but um, how do we 
keep these, you know, the, the stories going and um, these locations where kelp has been um, keep it in memory. So this is the typical story of the, the urchins um, eating the bull kelp. Our urchins are voracious kelp uh, uh, eaters, uh, herbivores, and many of these kelp forests up on the north coast have a flift regime to urchin barren. Um, there's the um, there's that lovely abalone there. Um, and uh, what are the factors that have given rise to these uh, urchin barrens was these I'm sure you've all heard this, the um, ocean warming events uh, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, we had the starfish wasting disease. Um, this was a piece I made um, that's printed on a big aluminum panel of a whole collection of culled urchins from the North Coast. They were sent to me in a box and none of them broke actually. So I piled them onto my scanner um, and made this, it, it sits very large. Uh, so there's actually an urchin image in there with the seaweed images. Um, and this was a piece I made um, uh, as a kind of homage to the kelp on the North Coast, um, where um, I'm including uh, Alexander Postel's amazing uh, kind of crown of the big bull kelp uh, with my own ghosted out uh, version. So um, one of the reasons we don't have um, kelp on the North Shore is that the top predator has been gone for a long time, the sea otter. And throughout my work on the kelp forest, uh, the sea otter story has been really interesting in how in Northern California, it generally was dropped out of the story until recently, it's kind of creeping back in, uh, mostly to, to some of our efforts who are constantly trying to make sure uh, that in Northern California, people remember even though there are no sea otter there, many people don't understand that, that there have been no sea otter in Northern California for um, over a century and a half, um, but that, that they were part of the evolution of that ecology. Um, and of course they are voracious urchin eaters, uh, as well as the Pycnopodia sea star, um, which died off with the starfish wasting disease. So it was interesting at the seaweed festival, there was a lot of talk um, about the, um, the starfish uh, hatchery, I guess you'd call it a hatchery up at, at Friday Harbor Labs where they're really research researching how to um, bring back the, the sunflower sea star. If you go up to Kodiak, to Alaska, the sunflower stars are not rare. I saw four of them in one little cove that I was snorkeling in. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, <gasps> this is what we're dying to see on the California coast. Um, and so, um, and so there's interesting conversation about um, these strategies for recovery. Um, so the, um, uh, and, and, and one of the things that I'm finding really interesting in my role as an artist is that it's really, really important to keep your ear out and be privy to all these conversations and to see who's, you know, who's promoting what, like, you know, the Nature Conservancy is, is doing great research. They're funding this research into the Pycnopodia recovery. Um, would the Pycnopodia on the North Coast have enough, you know, would they have the same problem that sea otter would have if you put sea otter back into the North Coast where these, these urchins just don't have enough uh, food source in them to support these top predators? That's a real, a real problem. Um, um, but it's a very interesting, interesting story and inter all sorts of efforts are going into kelp recovery. So this is really where my efforts are going now. It's into this entangled world that is the mysterious world of bull kelp. And the idea is, can you take the story that involves this kind of cast of characters that is the bull kelp as protagonist, um, urchins, abalone, sunflower sea stars, and then of course humans, we've been involved in this ecology from time immemorial and our relationship to these characters has shifted and changed and had enormous impact on the kelp forest um, as the fur trade exhibits and that we killed off um, the top predator very early on uh, that had an enormous impact. Um, so this was, is my idea for this next project, this mysterious world of bull kelp, is that we look at the range of, of bull kelp, which goes from, um, from really um, San Luis Obispo, um, is some of the, the historic kelp beds of, of Neriosis disc go all the way down to, um, to 
San Luis Obispo, and then all the way up through the Pacific Northwest, through BC Canada and the Southwest Alaska and into uh, Western Alaska and, and off into the Aleutians. And the Aleutians these days are having, you know, huge, um, like uh, ecological crisis. And is that story being told enough? Um, is that final kelp bed in Umnak Island uh, that was written about by Kathy Ann Miller in a paper in 1989, is that kelp bed still there as the westernmost extent of the bull kelp range? These are all questions that I think would behoove everyone who's studying bull kelp wherever they are. Um, and the idea was that each of these regions could tell kind of a slightly, could take on a different part of the story. In um, Southeast Alaska, there's lots of, of kelp farms, farming going on. And farming bull kelp has not been such a commercial enterprise, but it's starting to be uh, experimented with as perhaps a resource for restoration. Um, um, so one of the ideas was to go to these places um, so here I am in on a Falgnac Island. Uh, I went up to visit there um, in the spring. A friend of mine is an archeologist and his sister and I are good friends and we went snorkeling. Um, and uh, just being in the intertidal zone, deep tidal zones off of um, Kodiak and a Falgnac was just so fabulous. Everything's big and wide and, um, and the bull kelp was just coming up. But a point in fact was that when you are kind of trying to get a sense of an abundance or quality, say you're mapping um, the kelp, which has become this, you know, huge endeavor right now is to map the bull kelp to see where we are. Well, it, it really, really makes a huge difference what time of year you're mapping or you're looking. Um, and this was, um, it happened to be a good time to go, was um, Memorial Day last week of May, first week of June. And so the bull kelp um, uh, were just coming up uh, and these were quite shallow. They weren't the deep beds. We could sense some of the deeper beds. Uh, but my friend Patrick, who we were visiting, who lives there and is out, he, as I say, doing these archeological surveys, he wrote me at Labor Day and said, oh my gosh, the bull kelp beds are just in full force um, right now. And um, I wasn't quite seeing that in June. Uh, and despite flying over quite a lot, you, you go by plane everywhere. So you get to fly, you get to tell the pilot to say, could you, you know, fly over those kelp beds that I've been looking at on a map from 1912, um, these historic kelp maps and see if those beds are there. Well, in in June, it's hard to tell, it would be much easier. Um, and that's true for any kind of mapping of the kelp. What quarter of the year are you looking at? Um, so that's been one of the, the kind of issues, one of the aspects of this project, this, this um, mysterious world of bull kelp was to see how could I look at these historical maps and work with contemporary maps that are being done now and the kelp watch, um, incredible kelp watch site has definitely been on my radar to, to, to kind of give this contemporary mapping um, uh, forum. Um, and this is a, a historical map from the coast of, um, of Mendocino. Um, you see Saunders Landing, this is Saunders Reef, which is really quite a famous reef right there. Um, but this is a continuous line that I have of these kelp squiggles that if you're deep in the NOAA website looking at um, nautical charts, you're always looking for the kelp squiggles. And I've highlighted this one here that continues for mile after mile on this, from the Sonoma coast up into the Mendocino coast. Um, and um, yeah, it certainly is not that continuous line today. Um, and again, trying to parse historical uh, mapping data I went to the uh, California Fish and Wildlife uh, data from their aerial kelp surveys from 1986 to 2016. And I kind of stuck them into that um, QGIS, open source GIS program and was really looking through them year by year. And each year seemed to be at a different time of year. The polygon seemed to be um, not necessarily related one to one and how they were mapping. And so I kind of gave up and said, let's just use them as a beautiful resource and make some interesting imagery. This is for the Monterey Peninsula in particular. And this was a specimen of bull kelp from the Monterey Peninsula um, that I made this cyanotype uh, from and overlaid onto that um, GIS data. 
Um, this is the Oregon coast. So here, this is me um, searching for those kelp squiggles and incorporating some of those historical 1912 charts with some earlier 1800s uh, nautical charts. And then uh, the yellow and blue are the nautical charts that we recognize if you're a sailor, um, as I am certainly that yellow and blue is, you know, before, before the electronic navigation, you always had your charts with you. But again, I didn't feel like I could, I could come up with any real um, information out of these charts that was meaningful in, in some way, except for that it was there at this time and place uh, when these mappers happened to go by, whether it was by boat uh, or otherwise. Um, and this is a map from these historical charts that I have um, been referring to from 1912. Uh, and I've actually overlaid the 1880s um, chart of, of that Saunders Reef um, here with the 1912 kelp maps. Uh, and these were a series of maps that were um, commissioned by the Department of Agriculture in 1911 and 1912. And uh, they decided that there was real commercial value to the kelp beds uh, off the coast of, um, of, the, of North America. And um, it was when um, potash from Europe was becoming very expensive. There were world wars and there was problems and um, uh, potassium uh, for fertilizer was in great demand. So the possibility of these kelp beds as a great resource, American resource, uh, wanted to be um, assessed. So the Department of Agriculture made these beautiful maps uh, between 1911 and 1912. Um, and so this is bed number 35 was the Saunders Landing bed. But one of the most important things about those historical maps is what is written and highlighted behind this chart. Uh, and, and it reads here, it happens that this year, 1912, was an unusually poor one for a kelp harvest, as will be explained more in detail. Most of the beds were thinner than usual, and especially along the North Coast sections. So what they do, he talks about the, the sources that local seamen asserted, and the, and the Coast Guard people, and the lighthouse keepers, um, and the local fishermen were all saying 1912 was not a good year for kelp, that in fact, uh, kelp is very cyclical in its abundance. And so what I've overlaid on this um, kind of summary note is this chart uh, made by Meredith McPherson from her paper published in 2021 that's using the Landsat and satellite data to really assess kelp abundance. And what you see is, and that, that she assessed that from 1984 on is when we have really reliable um, satellite data that's, that's usable. Um, and that this is this cyclical nature of bull kelp. Um, and you can see if you go up to 2008, it's this gangbuster year that everybody is always comparing our current kelp situation to. Um, but you do see from 2015 to 2020 and ongoing in 20 to 22 that kelp, we are not seeing that rise again in kelp abundance on the Mendocino and Sonoma coast. This is all just for bull kelp. Um, so. Um, that so so you really to assess and my my kind of um, and this and this cyclical nature is not only for kind of the coast in general but it's also for each individual bay or cove where you have a kelp bed um, and so you have to actually go there to see how the kelp is doing so that's kind of one of again this this mysterious world of bull kelp project is how do we go and talk to the people who are working in each of these regions and become really connected to them to assess how the kelp is doing in their particular space. Um, so I got to go up to Mendocino and snorkel up at Portuguese Beach in this kelp bed. This was April. And I got to do this um, for the Earthshot Prize um, um, segment, Revive Our Oceans, and represent the kelp forest and make sure the kelp forest story uh, was in that um, pretty cool uh, BBC series that was narrated by a whole bunch of interesting people as well as David Attenborough. And the kelp of Northern California, as was photographed here um, and put together in that, was really representing all of the kelp forests around the world, Australia, South Africa, where kelp is in um, in steep decline and is really trying to be studied. So those few, so I so this was spring. There were all these kelp babies coming up to the surface, and of course I had to 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 swim back with a bunch of little kelp specimens that I brought back, and I kept having to tell the 
the cameraman, please photograph the kelp. Don't photograph me. This is the story of the kelp. Let's let's front. Let's keep the kelp as front and center of this storytelling, which um, as a writer, as a photographer, as an exhibit curator is really one of the things I keep coming back to is how do we make sure that the bull kelp itself remains the protagonist? Is It's not about us, it's about the organism. Um, even as we try to save our planet, let's keep the organism as the central focus of the story. So I, I scanned those three little specimens that I brought back from Portuguese beach and then translated them into these banners that you see here uh, that is the intro or entrance to this exhibit uh, downtown, which is really called kelp. Um, and I think um, I, I have a picture of it, but it's again, me really trying to say, how can we tell this kelp story of a particular place? And that I know these three um, kelp babies, bull kelp babies are from Portuguese beach from this kelp bed. And, but I don't really necessarily know that the, that the maps of that kelp bed are going to tell me the full story. And is there a different way to characterize what's happening in a particular place to the kelp beds. And this is where, this is kind of a very, very first, first go at this idea of a kelp index. And might, might we be able to develop some kind of a graphic that would in a glance tell you who the players are? So I'm, for example, using Port Orford here. And if you can see over here on the right, I have the 1912 uh, map of the um, Cape Blanco and Orford Reef. Uh, here, um, beds number 11, 12, and then number 13 is at Port Orford. And down below in the blue map is the kelp watch um, map from the third quarter, the most abundant quarter of, I think, 2021. Um, and you can see there's only these tiny little specks of green there. But there's so much I don't know from those maps. And would there be a way to characterize the Orford Reef in a way where you could see the proportion of kelp to the proportion of urchin? You could see that otter and sunflower star and abalone might be players in the ecology, but they're not in the circle right now. They're ghosted out. Um, this is, again, a very first pass at this idea. I, I mean, literally plonked on the page. And you, so you're seeing my kind of brain in action right now. Uh, and I'm working on this with my partner, Mariana Luchel. And um, as we work through some of these ideas, um, but that you would include the fishing interests and the tribal interests and um, who's, who's, in the, who's in the game there at Port Orford. Um, I have on the left, all these different words for bull kelp, this idea that kelp the kelp can be named. It has all these different relationships to it that are not just the scientific community, that's well beyond the scientific community, and that those relationships are also really important and are kind of as important to be forefronted in the storytelling of this ecology. Um, so this is so so this is the the exhibit um, kelp that those. Um, Three Little Bull Kelp are the intro to, and this is what I hope you all can come to see in San Francisco. Um, you can make an appointment at the 836m.org. I think it's 836marc.org. I'll, I'll put the um, link in the chat. Um, and um, where a group of us artists have really centered the bull kelp. Uh, and, we, and we've realized that making a space like this, that it had, brings this wonder of um, this nearshore ecology in this dynamic way has allowed us to um, schedule all these other events around it. So we had a very uh, robust opening. Everyone was so glad to gather. Uh, we had a blue food event in the space um, where all sorts of different food vendors uh, got to talk about their connection to the kelp forest and their efforts to be part of uh, restoration efforts. And then we just had last week a, a policy panel in the space where the specifics of kelp restoration was talked about by a representative from California Fish and Wildlife, the marine sanctuaries, and the Nature Conservancy. So the state, the feds, 
and an NGO and how they're all really working together to try to cooperate and collaborate on making the best tools available and the best science to bear on actual kelp restoration. And that the art space can become that forum for conversation to me is just really thrilling. And part of uh, Mariana and my goal is to actually take this exhibit on the road and make this kind of a space available in other places uh, where the conversation up in Oregon, um, where um, Tom Calvinese is doing so much work with the Oregon Kelp Alliance, um, trying to do the science to do kelp restoration up there. And is there a way to bring the public along with those uh, by forefronting um, the local artists who are involved with, with kelp? So that's kind of our big, we have some big goals around this art and science idea. And um, that's, that's kind of what, what we're doing between this and the website, the, the mysterious world of the kelp index and the kelp website. Um, which is where we're at with their mysterious, my, my kelp, bull kelp story. Um, so this was um, an early um, wanting to highlight five foundational kelp. Um, this piece was actually inspired because I was asked to submit a proposal for um, a mural in a renovation of the Hastings Law School. And Hastings Law School has a preeminent, um, uh, um, e e the ecolog law of ecology, no, ecological law program. Environmental law, that's sorry, <laughs> I had a little brain dump there. Um, their environmental law program is very strong and robust. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool for a program that had this strong program to be have the foundational kelp that you're looking at as opposed to say founding fathers or something like that? Well, that program stalled with COVID. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening with Hastings Law School, but um, this was a slide I just received yesterday. I'm sorry, it's a little dim, but it's an installation of these five foundational kelp up at um, in Sydney, uh, British Columbia, which is right adjacent to Victoria. It's where you take the ferry from Vancouver when you're going to Victoria. And there's a wonderful aquarium and science center there called the uh, Shaw Center for the Salish Sea. And this is the exhibit space uh, that looks right out at the Salish Sea. So I've created these custom banners of the five founding kelp, five foundational kelp, and they just hung, this show just opened on Saturday. So the director just sent me these slides um, and they've actually projected some of these images of the fish in on the kelp. So this suggestion that the kelp forest in a very visceral visual way that the kelp forest is what is responsible for this richness, for the health of the fish uh, populations, for the whole ecology, for even our human cultural um, uh, um, richness is kind of for me symbolized in this one slide. And I couldn't be happier to be experimenting in this visual realm with all these different groups like this, um, the Aquarium, the Salish Sea, which is very connected to the First Nations and um, bringing their story into the seaweed story. Um, and so from there, I'll just show you a few of these um, images that are for me really about the richness, the abundance of the flora at our ocean's edge. And I'm able to translate these images. Well, number one, they look great on the screen because um, this is its native environment. These are digital images first and foremost. Um, so they look really good as a projection, but then um, I just have taken them down as a fine art triptych, a very large triptych. Um, and that's actually um, in my garage now. So if anybody wants this image as a big um, 52 inch high triptych, please be in touch. Um, but they've been in a number of different art installations over the summer and through into the fall until now. Um, here is one of these Ocean's Edge uh, groupings. This was the installation of the 836M gallery. And so from the outside of the space at nighttime in particular, these uh, glow up in this clear story. So it feels like the seaweed is up above at possibly what could be thought of as the surface of the ocean. And then I really, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I did something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I kind of, I kind of um, picked all the shekels out of my uh, couch cushions 
and uh, went to my local foundry and took one of my seaweed squiggles that I pick up off the beach and had it cast into a piece of bronze uh, that was then I then worked with um, uh, the, found, the foundry chemists who do the patina and gave it this great, incredible um, uh, patina that kind of felt like uh, it might be how the bull kelp felt. So my, my, one of my great um, uh, kind of long-term aspirations is to find a situation uh, where we could, oops, sorry, that, um, where we could um, cast one of these really big um, get the funding and the place, um, something like the, uh, an Academy of Science where children and grown-ups are interacting outside and there would be this enormous cast bull kelp that you could climb on um, and, and interact with. Um, but because I don't have that big of a commission, uh, I'll show you this one, which was this really great, great project where we were able to bring the bull kelp to life at this huge scale. Um, and this was just this past summer uh, up at uh, Lincoln City in Oregon, uh, when the really low tides uh, were happening in July, I was asked to come up and be part of this art on the beach program uh, that was just in its second year. And um, the Cascade Head um, uh, Biosphere, um, Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve is the peninsula. If you look way up at the top of the right hand picture, that beautiful, beautiful peninsula is uh, the Biosphere Reserve, the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve. And the group of artists and um, ecologists that manage that uh, started this Art on the Beach program to get people involved, to get passers by and the public to be able to react to something that's just right offshore. It's right off the, the, the coastline there. And the first year they had gotten an artist to do some big diet, to do some diatom diagrams that they had drawn out. And this year um, they asked me to come and let's do the kelp forest. So I did a very um, kind of um, rough sketch and I was inspired by the kelp I had been snorkeling in uh, at a fog neck that it has this, that, that, that it's the bull kelp in particular with the current has this incredible directionality to it. And then I got to partner with these amazing artists, especially uh, this artist, uh, Frank Boyden that I'm pictured with here on the left with that big uh, long um, drawing tool that he has. He's a world renowned ceramicist. He's an amazing drafts person. And he was able to translate my sketch into the outlines that we then and a whole bunch of us volunteers had with our rakes uh, and we raked them out and then a drone was sent up um, and the and the kelp forest was captured complete with its sori there um, so this is really the translation of the drawing um, to the actual um, kelp forest on the beach which includes the sea otter so we partnered with the alaka alliance um, and it turns out one of the interns of the uh, Biosphere Reserve or from OSU um, actually did the drawing of the sea otter. Uh, and then that was translated into the sand. And then this also was the opportunity not only to engage with the public on the beach um, who were asked to join in and were told, you know, were, what are you doing? And then you get to go on and on about the kelp forest. But we also had a um, art workshop. We had a cyanotype workshop. Um, and we had a uh, symposium and talk uh, with me and the Alaka Alliance talking about the kelp forest in particular off the Oregon coast there. Um, so I partnered with Tom Calvanese and got some of his slides uh, to, to be able to talk specifically about what's happening uh, to kelp on the Oregon coast. So this was really a wonderful, wonderful way to bring art and science together. And for me to collaborate with other artists, which was so inspiring uh, and their work is ongoing and um, we just had a ton of fun. So I'll finish there. And I hope that there's time for questions. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, these are my books, The Curious World of Seaweed. Please, please, if you don't have it, yes, do get it and read it. It's got a lot of good history of science and especially women pioneering psychologists. So I really just every chapter has somebody amazing in it um, that was really kind of augmenting our understanding of the oceans. And they are mostly women, women. Um, and so I'm at, um, at Josie Island on Instagram and drop me an email um, and my website is there. 
So maybe I should just stop sharing and we could get some questions. <laughs>